Okay, so we're going to do a relatively straightforward and simple differential expression analysis. And here I'm just showing the counts table. So we have four control samples, and then we have four test samples. And in this case, they're just replicative senescence uh, endothelial cells from a study that I'll reference in the notes. So on the left here, we see the gene column. Each of these is just an ensemble identifier that references some gene. So we actually did more than just coding genes. So we actually have about 60,000 entries. We included non-coding RNAs, etc. And of course, these numbers refer to how many reads were aligned to that region, whatever is specified in the annotation file. So we're going to be using dseq2 for the differential expression analysis. And dseq2 was written in R, so we have to run it in R. So if you don't have R already, install R, and then I find using RStudio is much nicer. And you can save everything and keep track of what you've done in the past. So install R and then RStudio. And then when you create a notebook, you'll have something that looks like this. And we can just go ahead and get rid of all this right here. And then we can add a bunch of extra And then first, let's save this. And by saving it, we'll also set the working directory. So just go File, Save As, and then pick which folder you want the working directory to be, or where you want to save it. And now, if you don't have dseq2 installed already, you would need to go to Google, or just go straight to the Bioconductor website. But you can just type in Google Install dseq2 and then when you bring up the bioconductor link it gives you an installation block of code and you can just put that in your R code it looks something like this and I already have it installed but at this point you would just run this and it would install you might have to say yes or no or something on the console too then we need to load dseq2 so we can just say library dseq2 and then later, we're also going to need something called ggplots. So. ggplot2. So we'll load both of these modules. Get rid of some of these spaces. And then you can just clear this. We'll add another line. And then we need to load in the counts table. So we'll make a new variable called counts. And this will be a read dilemma of our counts table file. Just counts final, or actually, what was it? You can insert a bash line here instead of an R line, and then we can just look at the name here. So we'll just copy this and put it in here. Header equals true, because we do have a header. And then the row name is not the number one row. And then the separator, since it's a CSV, is a comma. So we'll read that in, no errors. So if we look at counts, now we see what we saw in Excel earlier, now in a data frame in R. So we see we have our four control samples, and then three plus one more here of the senescence samples. So eight total samples. And we see a lot of these you know, are zero, or only have a few mapped reads. So what we're going to do First, as a very simple pre-processing step, is we're going to filter out everything that has a sum of less than 50. You know, 50 is kind of arbitrary, but obviously you're not going to do differential expression between zeros and zeros, and then really low numbers can add a lot of noise. To do that, we'll just reassign counts as a filtered version of itself. So counts, which the row sums of counts 
is greater than 50. So again, 50 is just kind of an arbitrary number I'm picking here. If, for example, you're more interested in a really low abundant gene, maybe you would look at even lower than 50, or this threshold is something that you need to play around with, you at least should get rid of everything that is zero. So if we run this, we'll now see counts only has 14,800 rows as opposed to 60,000 like we had before. So now we have to assign the conditions of the experiment to the different samples. So let's add a block of code and we'll make a new variable called condition and we'll set this as a factor and then here we just need to list the condition. So I'm just going to give them one letter labels but you can label them whatever you want really. I'm going to label them C's for control and since there's four controls I need to put four C's here. So let me just do it like this. And then since there's four samples we need to add four um, I'll just call, I'll just make them S's for senescence or sample. So we'll add four S's. So we'll run that. And then we'll make a little data frame of these conditions and the samples. So we'll call that call data. And then we'll say data frame row names is equal to the column names of counts condition so if we look at that so next using this and the count matrix will actually start calling some dseq functions. So we'll make an object called dds and we'll call dseq dataset from matrix here. And our count data is of course counts. Call data is call data. And our design is condition. Remember condition was this here and call data was this here. And we also need to put a little tilde there. Then we should be able to run this. I just made a little typo here. Okay, so we have DDS now. And one really useful tip for doing anything in R really is if you don't understand how something works, you don't understand what it does, you don't understand what all the different arguments of a function are, you can put a little question mark in front of it and then when you run it, it'll actually pop up over here on the right and it'll show you, it'll give you a little manual of it. So if you're ever stuck and don't quite understand something, I recommend doing that first. Then we'll run dseq on dds. This will take a second. We can just clear that. And then we also want to create a new variable called vsdata. And that will be vst of DDS blind equals false. Alright, now we want to do a little bit of QC of our data. We haven't had a look at it yet. Who knows if the experiment even turned out that well. Well, we'll first do a PCA plot. So plot PCA of the VS data. And then the conditions int groups is the condition
Okay, so this isn't the prettiest PCA plot. Uh, if this was my data, I would have been a little bit concerned, but this is just a tutorial and we really don't have to worry about it that much. Everything else will be pretty much the same even if we move forward. But generally, you would like samples with similar conditions, such as the control here in red, to be clustered together and then the blue samples here to be clustered together. Or at least you don't want them spread randomly like this. They don't seem to separate with any individual PC that well. For example, if we look at PC1, we see they're on both sides, both colors on both sides. If we look at PC2, we see that they're pretty much on both sides. So this doesn't necessarily mean your data is complete garbage. You still may be able to get some differentially expressed genes out of it. But anyways, let's just move forward. Knowing that this is not the most ideal PCA plot. Next, we can look at the dispersion of the data. So let's do a plot dispersion estimate here of DDS. So I won't go too much into the details here, but basically what this plot is showing you is the dispersion of your data. So the variability between replicates as a function of normalized read counts. So as the read count gets higher, usually there's less variation. So you see a decreasing slope. So the main thing here is you want the data to be below one or not the data, the red line. You want the red line to trend below one. And the lower it is, the better. So here we do see that it does trend below one, but it's not really as low as I would usually like, but I would consider this to be okay, but not great. Anyway, so let's move forward. Next, we'll actually create a table of the differentially expressed genes. So we'll call it res for results and then call the results function of dseq using the dds object and then using the contrast which is just telling it what samples to compare so this is especially useful if you have more than two samples I think the default works without adding this argument but it's nice to actually put explicitly what samples you're comparing let's put the vector condition and then condition C. Actually, let's compare the sample against C. So S versus C. If you did the default, it would have compared C versus S because it would have found C first. So let's run that. Might take a second. Okay, so now we actually have the differentially expressed results. So if you look at res, see we have this big table of all 14,000 genes. So the main things we want to pay attention to here, well you can look at the mean, so the mean of that whole row, and then the log 2 fold change, if it's negative, like this one, it means that our senescent samples, this gene, was down regulated. If it's positive, it means that this gene in the senescent samples was up regulated. And then we also want to look at the p-adjusted value. So the p-adjusted value in this case is more important than the p-value because you need to correct for multiple testing. So you test, in this case, 14,000 different genes. Some of those might be significant just by chance, right? So you need to correct the p-value. You see it's, I think they use a bh correction. I could be wrong. I think you can change it if you add an, a different argument to the, the to this part. But it corrects the p-value and this is the one we actually care about. So we can filter this further. We'll just make a new table called SIGs, so significant genes. Well, let's first drop the NAs. You see this row, for example, has NA. And then 
we can filter out all the genes that adjusted p-value of greater than 0 0.05. So SIGs, SIGs p adjusted less than 0 0.05. And now if we look at SIGs, we see that there were 1400 genes that passed this threshold. So that's basically it for a very simple differential expression analysis. Again, with the caveat that this was very basic, but this should be enough to get you started. In a future video, I might show you how to convert these ensemble IDs to gene symbols, and maybe I'll show some graphing functions, such as a heat map, but for now, Let's just save this data to a CSV. So we'll just call write CSV SIGs and then the name of the output file. And then it'll just save that in whatever folder you're in.